for me now, a big question is why am I doing this in the first place? Should I be doing it? Do I really want to be doing it? Time is precious. Hello, hello, and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 210 with Mr. John Stork. He's a martial artist born right here in Vermont, but we've never met. He's now thousands of miles away, but we still have a few ties. Don't worry, you'll understand soon enough. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome, I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning fans, and welcome to all the new listeners. I've mentioned our sparring gear on the show a fair amount, because it's our bread and butter. It's the thing we started making because we wanted it so badly, and it's the way we finance everything else, like this show. We've had a lot of support from listeners over the last couple of years, but if you're a school owner or buyer for a pro shop, please check out our wholesale site. I'd love to earn your business. Mr. John Stork is not your typical martial artist. Aside from training with two of this show's wonderful guests, he's a talented circus and street performer with a solid foundation in the martial arts. Mr. Stork's love for the arts was drawn from his fascination in movies and television, just like so many of us. He's an accomplished individual with great experiences, which he shares here, along with his stories, aspirations, and so much more. Let's welcome him. Mr. Stork, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming on. Listeners, we're going we're gonna to get into some connections today, and I'm, I'm not going to spoil the story, but <laughs> Mr. Stork here has trained directly under two previous guests. And if you were to chart out geographically where all of our guests had come from, you might think that there would be some, some similarity. Oh, okay, you know, Jeremy, you're from Vermont, and, and Mr. Stork's from Vermont, so you're just going to name off two names from Vermont. Nope, that's not what's going to happen. And you'll have to listen to find out what that is. So we'll just, a little, little bit of a teaser, a cliffhanger, if you will. <laughs> Obviously, we're a martial arts show. You're on here to talk about martial arts because you're a, a martial artist. Sure. But there's, there's more to it than that. I mean, that we, we can't, your introduction can't be the back of a post-it note. <laughs> Why don't we no. roll back time, you know, hop, hop in our DeLorean and see what we can, we can find out about how you got started in the martial arts. Sure. I mean, that, for me, that's a pretty simple answer. Uh, I guess my real start was when I saw the Ninja Turtles on TV as a kid. And that got me pretty much more jazzed than anything else I'd seen in my life at that point. But I guess I was also used to the things I saw on TV not being real. So I probably saw Ninja Turtles when I was four. And then I didn't take a martial arts class until I was seven. And I think I was kind of surprised that martial arts were actually a real thing. I was used to things that would be that cool on TV and being made up or fictional. So I was pretty thrilled when I found out martial arts actually existed. What, what happened in between four and seven? So if you were a four-year-old watching Ninja Turtles, you were probably, you know, jumping up, trying to imitate the movements in your living room. If you were, oh, of course, of course, I had a lot of the plastic ninja weaponry, like size and nunchucks, perfect and throwing stars. Yeah, I mean, it was. And then you got. I you, wanted to be. And then you got going at seven and actually training. What what happened in between? Why the delay? I, I don't know. I mean, my parents had just moved from Manhattan to rural Vermont, so I think they were probably trying to get their footing with their own business. They make uh, mouthpieces for brass instruments, store custom mouthpieces, and. It was kind of a crazy thing they did to move from, I mean, they were right off Times Square. They had a, you know, a, a machine shop where they were doing that kind of work. And then to head into the green hills of Vermont, I mean, that's probably what was going on. I mean, they, they were attentive parents, but I think they were also very focused on making sure their business was going to stay afloat at that point with such change. Um, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time outside playing with my plastic weaponry at that point in my life, I'd say. And, I was really into Godzilla at that time as well. I, I often joke with people that if I'd been born in Japan, I probably would have been a normal kid. But here in America, I was kind of a, a misfit for sure at that age, especially. I was into the, I mean, Ninja Turtles was a mainstream thing, but not necessarily martial arts or just, you know, Asian culture. And I didn't fit in too great, actually. What do you but mean by I that? Had time to myself, so maybe that was good. Maybe that was bad. I don't know. What do you mean you didn't you didn't fit in? 
I just, I was really awkward at school. I guess maybe I didn't socialize enough with other kids my age before I went to school, you know, kindergarten, like I was instantly alienated. I just got picked on a lot. And I think that's also what maybe drew me to martial arts. It's like, oh, if you learn martial arts, they won't pick on you anymore, which ended up being true, but in ways that were deeper than I guess I thought initially. It's like, oh, if they pick on me, I'll kick their butts. But it's a lot more than that once you start training, which is great. Though. I mean, I, I don't know. It kind of, for me, it feels like it turned my life around. Not that my life was, could have been going that badly at age seven. I had great parents, you know, I lived in a nice place, but I don't know. It kind of just lit a fire that had not been lit yet for me. So age seven rolls around, your parents put you in martial arts classes. How did that go? Then, you know, I, I was part of this thing called Tiger Scouts or something. It's like the precursor to Boy Scouts. And yeah. like one weekend we were making apple cider. The next weekend we went to Fred LePan's karate class in Barry, Vermont. And I was like, I can't believe this is real. This is the coolest thing I've ever done. And then it was like, I think that was in the winter. I didn't start classes until like June or July. I don't know what year that would have been. I wasn't keeping track back then, but I don't know. I don't know why my parents waited so long because I was, you know, super thrilled about it and wanted to do it so badly. So you, you get in there, you know, you get some exposure from from being in Tiger Scouts and you go home and you say, I want to do this. And, and eventually they say yes. And they and they put you in classes. And what happens? I remember coming home after the first class and practicing in our living room. And I tried to kick as high as I could and I kneed myself in the face really hard and I fell over. That was like my first practice session after class. And uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, Freddie, you've done an interview with him. He's like the most charismatic guy ever. And I mean, back then, I mean, his prime has kind of lasted for like decades at this point, but yes. he was really in his prime back then. I mean, just so young, so enthusiastic. It was so contagious. And I mean, there's, there's a generation of us from that that time that are still, you know, at least loosely connected with the dojo and Barry, if not totally involved still. You know, Dylan Abair is one of those guys. Uh, Scott Grainer is another one of those guys. My mom, it was just, it was such an exciting time to be involved with Freddie in the studio. It was like plugging into a really, really huge outlet. <laughs> it was, uh, I don't know. And it was like a family thing too. Like it was, it was such a tight knit community. It felt like finding a new family and my family was involved too. Like three weeks after I started taking martial arts, my mom thought it looked so fun. And like I say, Freddie was so charismatic and contagious with that. She ended up signing up and, you know, she in many ways has continued a lot farther than I have. And, you know, at least traditional martial arts training, but I, I, my brother ended up taking classes as well. My little brother and, the dojo really felt like an extension of my family. And just kind of reading between the lines, maybe a place that you, you felt like you belonged early on. Yeah. And I guess I didn't feel that way at school at all. School was really awkward for me. And then all of a sudden I, I was like one of the normal kids at karate. And I loved it there. I mean, it was way cooler than school for me. I didn't, you know, school was always strange to me, I guess. But the dojo made so much sense and it was so exciting. What was it that made sense? Are you able to articulate that as you look back? You know, I think in school, I never really knew where we were going, which maybe I was just dumb. But like, you know, you walk into the dojo and there are the belts and there's Freddie. He's a black belt. And you see all the different belts and you just like you can instantly see kind of what's going on. Or I could anyway. And it's like, OK, there's a progression here. And furthermore, like, I want to make that progression. I see the difference in the lower belts and the upper belts. And it's so cool. I want to get there. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I felt instantly plugged in and I wanted to be there and I wanted to keep going. Whereas maybe at school, it's like, why are we, why are we doing this? I don't get it right now. Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not interested in this stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bad student. <laughs> Academically. I believe that everyone has their, their ideal way of learning. And for yeah. a lot of people sitting at a desk and having information thrown at your face everyone for learns. five, six, eight hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, not everybody learns that way. Yeah. And that's one of the problems, I think, with public school. Not that I want to get into that too much here, and you probably don't either. But, you know, it's definitely oftentimes a cookie cutter situation. Not everyone is the same cookie. And that sucks if you're getting, you know, 
mashed up every day. Yeah, yeah. Well, to to try to graduate with a degree in chocolate chips when you're a brownie <laughs> is not going to work out so well, is it? You know, I, I I think we all have our moments with that through through school. Yeah, we've got a pretty good idea of of who you are. I think now, at least, you know, <laughs> the the why. I think we understand sure. the why and and what has probably sparked you to continue on your journey. Mm. I have no doubt with those names that you mentioned and and the passion that you were just speaking with, that you've got some stories. I'd like you to take a moment. Tell us your best martial arts story. Yeah. You know, I thought about this, you know, trying to prepare for the interview and I don't know if anyone will think it's such a great story, but it kind of connects, you know, you, you interviewed another one of my teachers, Mike chat, and he talked about training Sam O'Hung. And for me, you know, I kind of, I started to lose momentum in martial arts actually after, you know, probably about four or five years of training, I got my black belt at that point, but I don't know. I was just, it was just kind of becoming a routine for me, but then what really, really re-inspired me and I'm still inspired by it to this day is Jackie Chan. When I saw Jackie Chan, it was a whole new world for me because he wasn't just doing martial arts. He was doing comedy and acrobatics and prop manipulation and stunts. And he was writing and directing his own movies. I don't know. It just, it, it totally uh, engaged with me in a way. I mean, of course, I was thrilled about Bruce Lee and, you know, Van Damme and Chuck Norris back in the day, but it kind of faded after a while, whereas Jackie Chan was just, it engaged me on so many more levels. So anyway, getting back to the best story, you know, Jackie Chan, he trained in the Peking Opera with Sam Hung and Yuen Biao and a bunch of other, you know, people who went on to do huge things in the Hong Kong movie industry. And coincidentally, I just feel that the Hong Kong movie industry totally in- influenced action films worldwide. I mean, I think that they don't get enough credit for how much they innovated, uh, you know, high paced action packed filmmaking and action sequences. Anyway, um, when I was training with Mike chat, I mean, I think that's where all the college money my parents might've saved up for me went. They used to fly me out to train with Mike chat in LA once a month for two or three years. When I was very young, I was like, between 12 and 15 is when I was doing that. And I mean, it, coming from rural Vermont, where, you know, I have a couple of trees and some cows to look at, which has its charm. And I appreciate that the older I get. But going from rural Vermont to Los Angeles, training with Mike Chat, who was a superstar in the sport karate world at the time. And then he knew all these people, too. Like he'd just gotten done working on martial law with Sam O'Hung, who I've been reading about and watching movies about. I, I just couldn't. I don't know. It was so much. It was almost overload. It was like dying and going to heaven. And uh, I remember one day we went down to uh, this area. It was called Monterey Park in L.A. And it's like this park where if you go out there on a Sunday, there's like multiple different groups of Chinese people practicing Tai Chi with like their master. And Mike would take us there to work with Ming Lu. I think she's Ming Chu now. She got her name changed, but she was national china wushu champion and she really kicked butt on the circuit here for a while she was on team paul mitchell and just you know i remember seeing her at ocean state nationals in rhode island i think is where that tournament is for the first time as a little kid and you just in america for me anyway you'd you'd never seen anything like that that type of form that type of kata um just the the stuff she was doing was so mind-blowing and here's a few years later fast forward training my chat he takes us to this park in la and he has us take Ming Lu's wushu class. And that that was really cool for me because, you know, the stuff I was doing with Mike was awesome, but Ming Lu was teaching us wushu, which is exactly what Jackie Chan and Jet Li are doing in their movies. So it was closer to what I was really, really passionate about. But anyway, we go out to a dim sum place after class, which is another like mind-blowing experience, like an authentic dim sum restaurant. And then who's in the back room? It's Sam Hung. He's got like this huge entourage with him they're having a feast and he's like come on come back here i know you mike you're one of my students and he brings us and it's like i don't know that was like nirvana for me martial arts nirvana when i I reached that point and i mean maybe i peaked young i was probably like 13 or 14 at that point but if i had to think about like my most rapturous moment in the martial arts that's probably it and i mean maybe that's not like an inspiring story i know that's what you're probably going for on the show but when i think about my favorite story from martial arts. That's probably it. 
I'm not going for for anything. You know, the <laughs> the longtime listeners know, and and you know from the the format of the questions I sent you, this is meant to be vague. This is meant to to give you a framework to talk about what's important to you, and clearly that story is important to you, and we can glean a a lot about you from it. You know, Perhaps. first thing, it's, it's kind of a selfish story, I guess. I don't see how it could be helpful for other people. And I wish I had one that was more helpful I, or inspiring. I, I don't think expressing a, a moment in your martial arts path that was significant to you could could not be inspiring. <laughs> right. Because right. of your dedication, because of your training, because of embracing that side of you, you got to meet Sam Hung. It wasn't because you were out to dinner. It was because you were a martial artist putting in a lot of time and money training. And then you got to meet him. And listeners, if you don't know who Sammo Hung is, I would have to say he's one of the most underrated martial arts actors ever. Would would you agree? Oh, of course. He's also an excellent choreographer and director. He's utterly fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, And Far too few people know who he is because if, if you watch his stuff, it's legit stuff. I mean, the, the man was able to bring real skill to the camera in a way that a, not a lot of people had during his time. Well, a lot of it goes back to the Peking Opera, you know, the, the school that him and Jackie Chan and Yun Biao trained at. It was just it was a factory for extreme talent. I mean, I think it was brutal and probably, you know, <laughs> It would definitely get shut down if it was happening here in America, especially in this day and age. But there's no denying it produced unreal talent. And, you know, people who made, who revolutionized at least the entertainment side of martial arts, if not other aspects as well. What else do you have going on in your life? You know, other than martial arts, have you had any passions that you spend time with? You know, when I was about 13, I started, um, getting involved with uh there's a, a circus in vermont for kids called circus smirkus and it's it's an international youth circus they get kids from all over the world to come and train and rehearse in greensboro vermont for about three weeks in june and then for the rest of the summer they take a real circus tent and they they pitch it all over new england and they do a show a real circus show but most of the performers in it are kids but as kids in that show you're getting to work with world-class circus coaches from all over the world, you know, Russia, Mongolia, China. Um, and it was basically right in my backyard um, in Greensboro. I grew up in Plainfield, Vermont. Greensboro is about 45 minutes away. It's part of what Vermonters call the Northeast Kingdom, which is, I mean, Vermont is already so rural and has this special quality about it. And the Northeast Kingdom feels even more removed and even more special. It's, it's a weird kind of mystical place if you know it. Anyway, um, that was kind of the next major turn my life took. It, but it was it was totally an extension of my martial arts training. The reason I started doing circus was because I wanted to learn more acrobatics to be more like Jackie Chan. And I wanted to learn how to, you know, flip a broom and catch it on my nose or balance it. Like Jackie Chan's skills are so off the chart and so well-rounded. And, you know, doing martial arts training alone, even with someone like Mike Chat, who's having you train with his guest instructors who happen to be Ming Lu or Sammo Hung, I don't know. It's just, there is more to learn. And I felt like circus was the way to do that. So I got pretty heavily involved in, in the circus smirkus for many years. And, uh, it, it was good for me though, too, because, you know, I was competing internationally at that point with Mike chat on his team, but I really wanted to perform. more. I really enjoyed whenever we do a demonstration that goes back to training with Freddie and Barry too. I, you know, tournaments, they had their charm and I, I got into it pretty heavily, but What I really loved was demonstrations and performing whenever there was a a show. Um, So I guess that's that's the next step in my life was getting involved with Circus Circus. Do you think that would have been as interesting to you had you not had the martial arts beforehand? I thought about that and I wonder, um, that's a great question. I I couldn't begin to answer it. But I mean, my, my first real love was martial arts. And I don't think if I'd seen a juggler, I mean, not to not to. Not to put down juggling, but I don't think it would have grabbed me quite the same. Absolutely not. I mean, there's there's something so cool to me about martial arts specifically. And and to really hone in on it, it's probably, you know, the Chinese martial arts. Um, they're, they're so old and they're so refined. Uh, they're so intricate. They're ornate. I, I really, I'm into that. 
I'm also into, you know, practical application. Like I'm taking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now, and that's something I've always been into, but never really got the chance to train. And now actually doing it, I love it. But I think the the artistic part of me and the part of me that I I try to focus on more for whatever reason uh, is really drawn to those those old Shaolin based Chinese styles, the animal forms, the weapon forms. I'm just so into that stuff. And uh, I'm not that into juggling. <laughs> <laughs> juggling was, you know, to supplement my martial arts training sure. and uh, make me a better performer, give me more rounded physical skills. I mean, I guess for me, that's something I always talk to my friends about who are other performers. Um, what I love is the combination of skill and comedy. I just think that's such a, I don't know, for me, that that's that's the ultimate. If you can be funny and be skillful, I think that's so, so entertaining. I agree. And I want to ask that question kind of in the opposite. Had, had you, you, you've spoken quite a bit about your, your passion for, and, and reverence for Chinese martial arts, for wushu and, and those yes. pursuits. Was that something that escalated? Because I'm, I'm trying to do the timetable in my head. Obviously, you had some, some affinity for those before Circus Mercus, But did your time with the circus change your perspective on those? Did they become more interesting to you? Um, I'm not sure it's possible for them to become more interesting to okay. me because they were already about as interesting as anything could possibly be for me. But um, I, it was always kind of something that's had to be on the back burner a little bit for me in my life for whatever reason. Um, I mean, training with Ming Lu once I was with Mike Chat, like secretly that kind of ended up being my favorite part of training with Mike. Don't tell him that. But that, that was later towards the time I was training with Mike. And I mean, I, I lived in Vermont and at that time I was getting old enough to realize how much money my parents were spending on my training. And it made me kind of uncomfortable, to be honest. And uh, Circus Smirkus, you know, it was right there. It didn't really cost my parents hardly anything for me to go train with my two Russian former Soviet circus acrobat coaches at the gymnastics gym around the corner or go up to Greensboro to, you know, go on the tour. Um, so I think that's part of it was a logistical thing for me at that point that it felt more responsible and more accessible. Um, but it was so new at that time too. I didn't feel like I was really sacrificing anything. Of course, if I had a perfect world, I'd be doing circus and wushu like right there together. But at that time, it just, it didn't seem feasible. You seem like a pretty happy guy. Sounds like there's quite a bit of smile going on on the other side of the microphone. I just like talking about myself. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take it in a little bit different direction. Okay. You've, you've moved, you know, you started in Vermont. You're not here anymore. You're, you're, you're doing a bunch of different stuff. Somehow, somewhere in there, some things must not have gone well. And I'm not saying that's why you moved. I'm just saying we all have stuff pop up. Sometimes yeah, it creates I transitions. Do. I've had a lot of obstacles. I feel like I just, okay. I mean, for starters, I just wasn't very athletic. Naturally, I was not a coordinated kid. I wasn't a strong kid. I was kind of pudgy. Um, so right off the bat with martial arts training, like I hit a lot of walls. Um, but I, I don't know. There's something interesting about that type of path. I think if you're hitting a lot of obstacles, it forces you to become more resourceful and more unique in a way because you have to come up with your own spit on things or it's just not going to work for you. So if you, if you start off not especially gifted in one way or another, it feels, it can feel like a curse, but sometimes looking back, I'm like, well, you know, that was very character developing. That was very, uh, you know, it forces you to, to think outside of the box. So I don't know. There's been a lot of gnashing of teeth in my martial arts training, but then there's been a lot of breakthroughs, I guess, and uh, elation that comes with that. Tell us about one of those breakthroughs. You know, that's kind of the, the weird thing about working with Mike Chat. I mean, he is such an excellent coach. It feels like pretty much every day you're training with him, you're having a breakthrough. Like if I, had to, I, I can't really pick one breakthrough because they felt so constant with Mike. And it was, that was kind of the miracle of working with him. It was like, holy mackerel, all these things I thought I couldn't do. I can do, even if I can't do them the way I thought I could do them. Like he's helping me figure out a way that I can do them given my limitations, but also my strengths that he's helping me figure out. I don't know. It was, it was so much. I really, uh, 
can't thank him enough. We had our differences later on in our training and working together, but he really, I can't state enough how much he made me who I am. Certainly a, a legendary martial artist. And of course, somebody that we've had on the show. And as you said, we've had it's both of your instructors. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't know. I feel like I had in a lot of ways, if I wasn't charmed in some ways, I was very charmed in other ways. And the people I've gotten to train with is one of the ways in which I'm very, very charmed. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what charmed means, what that's like hinting at, but it just seems like the right word for some reason. Yeah, I'll, I'll support your usage of that word for sure. <laughs> I'd like you to tell us about somebody other than those two, other than Freddie, other than Mike Chat, who were instrumental, influential, however you want to phrase that in your martial arts. Yeah, you know, um, there's a guy I met through circus and uh, he's like an older brother to me and um, he's never done martial arts, but in the circus, he was phenomenal. Uh, we both had the same, we were, he was kind of, I had two circus coaches, uh, Zena and Velodia, who I worked with mostly working at Smirkus. Um, and they were, you know, like I said, former Soviet acrobats before the Soviet system collapsed. And then they ended up here in America working for Circus Smirkus. But that just goes to show, you know, the awesome coaches that Smirkus somehow got to come and work for them. I think it's a, it's a charm thing. Once again, Cir Circus Smirkus just has this magical thing about it. You go up there in Greensboro and it's like a different world. It's like Circus Hogwarts or something. Anyway. <laughs> Um, he was kind of their main student and then he was older and kind of going off and doing his own thing when I came around and I kind of became their focus and I never ever came close to living up to what Sam did, but I always looked up to him and admired him. And I mean, he could do one arm handstands, no problem. He, his specialty though was the slack wire. And he, he was just, he was on such a different level than the other kids in circus smirkers who had the same kind of background as him, you know, kids living in rural Vermont, or he was from Maine as the case was living in the middle of nowhere, he would set up his slack wire, you know, in his parents' living room and practice. And, you know, the other kids who were doing that kind of thing, they were okay. But Sam was doing, you know, world-class stuff. And it was just his discipline and his mindset and the way he went about things that I think allowed him to master those type of skills. Like he, he would ride a unicycle. I mean, standing on a slack wire looks crazy. If you see someone get up on a slack wire for the first time, you're like, whoa, how, how do you do that? It's so unstable. He would ride a unicycle on the slack wire while juggling five juggling clubs. Like wow. he, he learned that in his parents' living room and he, he could do a one-arm handstand, no problem. He eventually learned how to ride a unicycle in a handstand, which is an unheard of trick because he wanted to learn it on the, on the slack wire. I, he just had a different work ethic, a different way of practicing. And it helped me with working with my chat he's kind of obsessive compulsive and so am I. And in, in some ways that wasn't a good combination. Like if you're, if you're analyzing everything, sometimes you can become paralyzed. And Freddie talked about that in his interview. He said, you know, too many minds. I think he's quoting the last samurai. Um, and that, that's something I think I have a tendency to do anyway. And sometimes with me and Mike together, like nitpicking every little thing, it, it wasn't necessarily in a lot of ways, we had a great chemistry. In some ways, we had a terrible chemistry. And that's an example of where maybe our training together was a little bit dysfunctional. And Sam Johnson, this other guy, this circus guy, he had such interesting and different ways of practicing and thinking about practicing than Mike had. It's like, he's like, what do you want to learn? And I was like, well, I want to learn this, but I should do this physical conditioning and this cross training and this and that to like come around to this one thing I want to learn. He's like, John, just practice that one thing you want to learn for hours a day for months. And it was so different. I, I don't know. It, and it was, I saw it get results for him and that wasn't necessarily the right way for me to practice either, but it, it was nice to have two totally different viewpoints and then come about some combination of those two viewpoints that worked for myself. Is your current approach to, to training somewhere in the middle then? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say it is. But I mean, there, there's so many more influences that have affected my, I guess, philosophy at this point or philosophies when it comes to training. I mean, for me now, a big question is why am I doing this in the first place? Should I be doing it? Do I really want to be doing it? Time is precious. And I've seen the, the results I get when 
I, I commit to something before fully examining whether I should be committed to it. And then a couple of years go by and wait, you know, I, I really shouldn't have been doing that at all. I didn't like, I didn't do enough soul searching before I set out to realize that wasn't really what I was passionate about. Maybe I was doing it because I, sometimes you do things in your life and they're built on false pretenses. And that's, that's one thing that Sam really helped me with. I mean, he's, he's kind of a guru in my life and it's just like, he doesn't, he doesn't take any BS. Like he, he won't do things unless he wants to do them. It's that simple. It, it like, sometimes he can appear lazy on the outside, but he's actually like the most disciplined person you'll ever meet, but he's really good at, you know, siphoning through falsehoods and latching on to his own personal truth. And that's probably the, the most valuable skill you could learn maybe in life, let alone martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that as a, as a entrepreneur and, and hanging around other pro- entrepreneurs, one, one of the bits of advice that I've really latched onto over the last probably six months has been, if it's, if it's not a yes, or if it's not a heck yes, you know, and, and some people throw a, an expletive in there. Sure. If it's not a really strong resounding yes, then it's a no. Because you do only have that 24 hours in the day. Right. And rather than do something that kind of gets you towards your path, throw something in there that definitely moves you towards that. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to work with someone else, someone that you haven't, you know, someone alive, someone who's passed, who would you want to train with? I would want to go and be in the same class, the same group that Jackie Chan and you and Gavin Samahung were in at the uh, Peking Opera and see if I could, if I could hang, I guess. Like they used to start their day with a half hour handstand. Like on my best day, I think I've done a two minute handstand and I felt like I was going to die. I don't, I just don't get how that was possible. Maybe it was just starting that young or being that consistent. I think the, the Sifu there, the guy who was in charge of the whole thing was Yu Jim Yen or something. I, I looked up his name online last night. I probably knew it when I was a kid. Cause I used to read every book on Jackie Chan. I was part of the fan club. And um, anyway, I'd like to work with him and those guys in that, that class that they grew up in, in the Peking opera. I mean, I don't know if I would have survived to be honest. Like I think it was pretty brutal. I don't know if I could have hacked it, but that I would like to try. That's an interesting answer. We haven't had anybody that, it's come at it from that side, and I like that. And it, it <laughs> it's it's completely consistent with everything else we've heard about you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty kind of a one track record, I guess. In some things, <laughs> <laughs> how about competition? Has that ever been part of your life? Yeah, I mean that's pretty much all I did from like eleven to fifteen until I started doing, you know, performing Smirkus. Um, even before that, I probably went to my first tournament when I was nine or ten. Um, I mean, it was hard not to go to tournaments, even if you hated them, if you were training at Freddie's school, because Freddie lived for those tournaments. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I was never, I got into them, you know, through the influence of the people I was around. My mom is a very competitive woman. Freddie mentioned her a lot in his podcast, Phyllis, Phyllis Stork. Um, Freddie is an extremely competitive person. Uh, the group I was coming up with, you know, Dylan A. Bear. Scott Grainer, we all kind of pushed each other. Um, Colin Blanchard is another name that comes to mind from that time. Josh Dickinson. It was just a group of kids at Freddie's school. And Freddie just, it was part of how he ran his class, I guess. But we were, we were all really close friends. We were like brothers, but we were also constantly competing with each other. And of course, that extended into the tournaments. It's like, holy mackerel, it's not just us. There's all these other kids out there we have to try and outdo. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Looking back on it now, I maybe I kind of see around it. Like it's not about being better than other people. It's about, you know, honing yourself. And Fred said that on his podcast as well. So yeah, I guess I have I have mixed feelings about my competition career. I mean career. I never got paid for it, but <laughs> my time competing because I was I was very entrenched in it while I was doing it. But I'm not sure it was the best fit knowing who I really am now. I don't think that's the best way for me to actualize myself is going to tournaments, but I'm, I'm sure it, it, I gained a lot from it. 
Sorry, that was that's probably a really roundabout. Long uh, no, those thing. those are the best. I, I have a saying, and and you and I didn't Same. talk about this piece of it, you know, before we started recording. But I've said this to a number of guests before we start, quote unquote, rolling tape. <laughs> the best stuff comes in the edges. Mm. It's when the guests wander and and get in deep, get deep into a tangent. That's where, personally, I'm the most entertained. And and listeners, I love you all, and I'm glad that you're here. So I'm not just a crazy guy talking to people and recording it, but um, we will always do the shows in a format that I like because <laughs> I'm the one that's got to be here for every single one. So I, sure. I need to enjoy it. Right. And I, I love that you, you circled with that. And it, it leads me to a follow-up. What is a better way for you to, you use the word actualize mm-hmm. what you're doing now, you know, is what, it, what methodology works better for who you are today? I guess I'm still working on that, but I would say in regards to competition specifically, looking back on it, I think I probably should have moved on sooner than I did because I was ready to move on. I had new interests and I think I'd learned what I needed to learn from competition and I was just going through the motions and that's that's when it became stale for me. Like I'm showing up at this tournament even though I don't want to be here just because you know my teachers say I should or I, I know it's the quote unquote right thing. I shouldn't be quote unquote lazy and not go to this tournament. But, you know, looking back on it, I think I had the right impulse to move on and start doing other things, like not abandon what I'd learned in any sense, but I had new interests. I had new passions. I was learning new things. And my impulse was to go with that. I I wish I had followed the passion more and not tried to be so, like I say, quote unquote, disciplined, um, which is a weird thing to say because I think discipline is a good thing. But when it becomes mindless, that's bad. You're a robot and you're not learning or growing. Um, so it's a, I think discipline can be a double-edged sword. Uh, you need to be disciplined, but you have to keep thinking and you have to keep reflecting and you have to keep being honest with yourself. And I think it's a weird mixture. You know, you have to, you have to employ discipline, but you also have to employ passion. And if passion is dead, you really need to examine that, I think, for myself. And there's usually a way to rekindle it, but you have to find that way. Doing the same thing that you're doing oftentimes isn't the way to rekindle the passion. It's really an interesting way to to phrase that because I think you just coalesced something for me that I've never been able to articulate. And I'm I'm envisioning, because I'm a different kind of nerd than than maybe you are, I'm envisioning a a Venn diagram, you know, with (laughs) one circle being passion and the other circle being discipline. Mm-hmm. And you've got that intersection point. And I think most people overcorrect. You know, they may recognize that they're they're out of that balance, mm-hmm. but they steer to one side or the other because I think inherently yeah. one side or the other is more comfortable for us. I mm-hmm. anyone that knows me personally knows I am going to err to the side of discipline. If you look at my calendar, it is, you know, I, I schedule when I'm going to eat lunch. I schedule mm-hmm. when I'm going to clean my desk. Like it's it's horrendously structured. <laughs> and I know other people who seem to, from my vantage, wander through life. You know, they're passionate. They they mm-hmm. go from thing that they love to thing that they love. And yeah, you've seen you've seen enough success to know it, what it's like to to ride that middle. You know, I think for me personally, if I stay in one or the other for too long, I wear it out and it it becomes dead or it it just, it loses its, its efficacy after a while. And I think it's good to, to spend time in both. Otherwise it becomes, you become numb to it either way. I've gone through periods in my life where there was nothing but discipline. I've gone through periods in my life where I let myself be completely unstructured and just be passionate and follow my passions. And Either one, if I stay in that mode too long, it it becomes ineffective for me. But everyone's different. But I think that's maybe one of the most important lessons learned too. It's like, you know, yes, there's people out there you can learn from. There's people out there you can emulate. But in the end, you have to write your own story. You have to create your own version of yourself. You have to write your own plan. And you can use inspiration from other people, but... If you're just copying and pasting, in the end, that's going to end up being a recipe for disaster, which is scary because it's easy. It's lazy in a way, and it's comforting to be like, oh, that's working for them. I'll just do it too. 
And that will work for a while. You can learn a lot from doing that for a bit. But in the end, you have to just take what works for you from that and move on and leave behind, like identify the things that don't work for you. And it's it's a purification process that requires constant reflection. That's a bad thing to say, too. If you're constantly examining something, you're focused on, you know, too few things. There's a bunch of things going on behind you that you're missing at that point. Like, once again, like I was saying earlier, I think you have to variate really intense um, examination of things with giving yourself a break and letting your subconscious work or letting outside influences come into play. If you put on your own blinders, that's bad too. I mean, there's a time and place for that, but I don't know. I think variety is important. I think a lot of martial arts training is very structured and very rigid. And that's, that's the discipline's important. It's a key component of martial arts, but it's not the only component and you need to mix it with other things. And, and Freddie was talking about that with Bruce Lee. He was, he was so creative. And a lot of that comes from taking off the blinders. Well said. We've talked a bit about movies, certainly with, with your, your training with Mr. Chat. You know, we know that the, the dramatic flair, I mean, circus, the things that a lot of us love about the choreography in martial arts movies, I'm, I'm sure is right up your alley, something mm-hmm. that, that you enjoy. So I'm curious, what martial arts movies do you, as someone who has taken their martial arts training to that level, what ones do you look at and enjoy? Well, I knew this question was going to be part of the interview, and my answer isn't, okay, here's what <laughs> My favorite martial arts movie is not a straight-up martial arts movie. It's Project A by Jackie Chan. I think that was when he hit his peak, his prime. Um, it's it's more of an action adventure with a lot of martial arts, but Sam Hung is in it, Yoon Biao is in it. It's so, it's such a fun movie. It's It's very Indiana Jones-esque for me in that, it's just uh, it's a very swashbuckling adventure with phenomenal stunts, phenomenal fights, great comedy. Um, that's my favorite martial arts movie, even though it's not necessarily a straight up martial arts movie. If we're going to talk about straight up martial arts, I think for me, you have to look at Drunken Master and Drunken Master 2. Those are both amazing, just pure martial arts movies. And the thing is, in America... Drunken Master 2 is released as Legend of the Drunken Master, but that's actually Drunken Master 2. And it was made like 10 or 15 years after the original Drunken Master. Um, But try to seek out the original Drunken Master if you can. It was made in the 70s. It was uh, Jackie Chan's real breakout hit was Snake and the Eagle's Shadow. And Drunken Master is pretty much a shot for shot remake of Snake and the Eagle's Shadow. Same director, same actors, just a different style. It's Drunken Fist instead of Snake Fist. They're both excellent, but. Really try to see Drunken Master. I, Fist of Legend is another straight up martial arts movie that I think is so excellent. Um, a lot of those early Jackie Chan, not too early. Jackie Chan had a weird career. His first movies kind of were crap. He was working with Lo Wei, who was the same guy who worked with Bruce Lee. Yeah. Um, and you know he was trying to turn Jackie Chan into another Bruce Lee, which clearly Jackie Chan was not. But I guess that's that's an interesting lesson for martial artists too. Like you're trying to follow in the footsteps of this legend, and there's no denying that that guy was amazing, Bruce Lee. But this this other director is trying to force you to be that guy, and you're not that guy. So, yeah, you're making movies. Uh, ostensibly, you're successful, but you're not really successful until you find your own way. And that's when Jackie Chan really achieved success, even though he'd been making movies before that. He had to become his own person, invent his own style to really take off. Good advice for all of us, isn't it? And, I and, hope so. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure that, we we can already answer this question, but I'll, I'm going to ask it out of courtesy. Your favorite martial arts actor? Yeah, of course it's Jackie Chan. <laughs> right. Let's let's flip out of movies. Let's talk about books. Are you at all a reader? Are there martial arts books that have come into your circle? Um, martial arts books specifically, I would say no. I mean, I, I read a lot of biographies when I was younger. I guess Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. Um. But no, I I don't seek out books specifically about martial arts. But I I do read. I I think reading is – I mean, I'm not going to say reading is important for everyone, but reading is a way that I interface with information well. What are your goals? What's keeping you going? You know, you mentioned that you've transitioned your training BJJ now. Mm -hmm. You know, 
you've been doing martial arts a long time, like nearly all of our guests. It's something that's really become part of who you are. And I find that for everyone, I'd say without exception, those folks that are continuing to train years later have goals. There are things that, that they're striving for. What are yours? Sure. I mean, I, I guess I have a lot of vague, like overarching goals that maybe everyone has. Like, you know, I want to be a good person. I want to take advantage of my life. Uh, you know, I don't want to waste it. Specifically for martial arts training, I'd like to get my blue belt in jujitsu. <laughs> I know that's not terribly ambitious, but I'll be really happy if I get my blue belt. I have goals in my career. I mean, I think growing up in martial arts pretty much without fail makes you become a goal oriented person. And it's almost subconscious at this point. Like I don't think about my goals consciously because I'm constantly thinking about them subconsciously. Like it's just, it's almost uh, invisible to me because it's so automatic. But yeah, I mean, I, I could give you a list of goals a mile long, but that would be boring. Fair enough. Let's talk about what you're doing right now. Sure. You know, give us, give us the highlights. You know, what, what are you, what are you doing professionally? What are you doing personally? If people want to reach out to you, if you do the social media thing, you know, tell us, tell us about you in that way. Commercial time. We generally call it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not very good at selling myself, but, uh, I live in Boulder, Colorado now. I, I, pretty much make almost all of my living as a street performer. I work on the street now performing a circus style show. I stack up a bunch of chairs and juggle fire, breathe fire and do a handstand on top of the chairs. I wear stripes and a top hat. If you see me, you'll know it's me, but you probably won't see me unless you're in Boulder. Cause that's pretty much where I stay now. I usually go down and perform in Key West in the winters cause it's too cold to perform here or in Vermont. I did hundreds of shows on church street in burlington vermont it's kind of where i cut my teeth street performing wise there in key west but i've also street performed in boston at faneuil hall as part of that program for a summer and my favorite part of boston was working i can't i should have looked up the name i worked with a great wushu instructor he had a class that's embarrassing i don't remember the name but that was the thing i missed most about leaving boston because otherwise i didn't really care for boston it's too much traffic I like the country. I grew up in the woods. Um, and that's what's nice about Boulder for me now is, you know, we're surrounded by beautiful nature. It doesn't really feel like too much of a city. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm a street performer now. Um, I started street performing because I wanted to, you know, I, I have Sam, the guy I was talking about earlier, he started street performing and he told me he was making pretty darn good money. I was surprised how good the money was he was making as a street performer. And what I really wanted to do back in the day when I started street performing was, you know, direct and produce and perform in my own circus act that I could create exactly the way I wanted to create it. And I needed money for that. Um, but it took me years and years to finally start making decent money as a street performer. It was a real brutal process for me. Actually, I was very stubborn and I wanted to do things my way, but a lot of street performing is about listening to your audience rather than yourself. You, you don't get to be the dictator. I don't anyway. I'm not talented enough to be the dictator as a street performer. But through that process, I realized what I was most passionate about in my life at this stage was, um, you know, I, I grew up obsessed with anime and manga and video games, you know, and uh, Dragon Ball Z was like everything to me. Maybe it still is. And the funny thing is that uh, Akira Toriyama, the manga artist who created Dragon Ball and did the original comics that it's all based on, he was inspired after watching Jackie Chan in Drunken Master. So it's kind of weird how pretty much everything in my life comes back to Jackie Chan. It's, it's kind of creepy, actually. But anyway, um, I, I started to learn or I, I've been studying screenwriting. I really want to write and direct for animation someday. Like Hayao Miyazaki is another huge inspiration of mine. He does the Studio Ghibli films like Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, House Moving Castle. You name it. He's just a, a master filmmaker and animator. Uh, anyway, I would love to have my own animation studio someday. I'll be amazed if it actually happens, but that's what I really want to do. And towards that end, I've been studying screenwriting. I've written a couple screenplays and I'm turning one of them into a comic book, which uh, will hopefully help sell the screenplay. But even if it doesn't, I don't care because I'm very passionate about comics and making it into a comic book has been a really fun process. But 
I personally can't draw to save my life. So I have to hire an artist to work for me. Um, and that's where most of my money goes. I'd say I spend half of every dollar I earn on paying an artist to turn the screenplay into a comic book. So please, if you're interested in comics at all, check out my comic book. It's called tomb busters, T O M B B U S T E R S. You can find it at tombusters.com. It's about a treasure hunting tournament in space. It's very, uh, action adventure there is going to be some martial arts in it uh yeah i don't know what else to say that's good stuff and we'll, and we'll, <laughs> we'll certainly link that and you know all the other stuff that we've talked about for anyway that might be new whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place that we do that you can see everything you know we'll get some photos over there so you can see who we're talking to and everything and, and that's that's good stuff you know i, I think that multimedia approach it's not really the words that i'm looking for it does not surprise me that you are a performer with aspirations for directing and and you're doing writing and you're trying to express that inner passion in so many different ways you know as as we as we kind of roll back to the beginning of the episode it was clear to me as you talked about the very first anecdote you gave us you practice kicking in your living room after your first martial arts class and hit yourself in the chin with your knee. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that requires a lot of effort. That's not <laughs> something most people can do, even if they try. <laughs> so I think that for me, that, that kind of, that bookends what we've been talking about here. And I, I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's, uh, I don't know, a lot of the stuff I haven't talked about in a long time or even necessarily thought about, it's kind of, in some ways, it's a past life, but I don't know, doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu again now and putting on a white belt and putting on a gi again for the first time, basically, since I was a kid. I mean, I, I've been taking martial arts on and off the whole time, but this is the most formal classes I've taken since being a kid. It really is like time travel, and it's it's almost like reincarnation, but you know things from your past still, and you get to learn from those mistakes and learn from you know the successes as well. It's It's so interesting life is longer than you think it is. It's short, but it's also longer than you think it is. And you get to relive things. I don't know. Sorry. That's uh... no, no worries. And certainly no need for an apology. I'm not even going to accept it because you <laughs> didn't do anything wrong. Well, I, I appreciate your time here today. And I'd love for you to leave us with one last bit of advice. Yeah. I feel like after my like uninspiring, uh, unhelpful, best martial arts story, I've kind of been like, trying to hand out advice the whole time now to like make up for that and compensate. So yeah, I guess to try and sum it all up, I'd say you have to try to, it's like a, a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. I think he says you have to write your own Bible. And I think that's, that's true in martial arts and in life, you know, you have to learn from other people, but in the end you need to make something that works for you and is suited uniquely to you because you're unique and you can't just go through that cookie cutter. And it's a harder path in some ways, but I think it's it's what you have to do. You have to be vigilant. You can't just ride the same train everyone else is riding. At points, you can do that, and that's fine. But in the end, you have to build your own train, your own vehicle to get you where you're destined to go. There are a lot of ways to take martial arts training out into the world, and Mr. Stork shows us yet another. After he sent me photos of him performing in a local pedestrian mall, I remembered seeing him. This is one man who knows how to work a crowd. Thank you, Mr. Stork, for coming on the show. Over at WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with some killer photos and a link to the comic book he's working on. It's a lot of fun, so definitely check that out. Find us, WhistleKick, on social media. At WhistleKick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're also on YouTube. We're on Tumblr. We're all over the place. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, WhistleKick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. Don't forget our wholesale program. Find that at WhistleKick.com. This is all for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.